Um, first, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, Cindy and I have really enjoyed uh, the few days we've had in Paris. Uh, this is the most beautiful city I've ever been to. And I'm not just saying that because you guys are here. It really is terrific. It's hard to find your way around in this city because the streets are very confusing. But I, I really, we really enjoy it. So thank you for and thank you for inviting me here today. This is a great incubator space. Uh, I, I've got a little tour. We had a discussion about it, and uh, uh, it's really encouraging to see that new ideas are being uh, uh, supported by at least an infrastructure uh, that helps it. Um, my name is Steve Steve Sasson, and uh, I uh, I worked at uh, Eastman Kodak Company for over 35 years. And uh, it was in uh, early uh, 1975, uh, or late 1974, uh, that I had an idea that I thought uh, would be of interest to the company. Uh, and so uh, I developed uh, a digital camera and, and basically a digital photographic system. And um, so the story I'm going to tell you is a little bit starts there. Uh, and it goes through uh, the entire history of Kodak and how we reacted to this revolution. And I'm going to give you some inside stories and some inside examples of things that are probably not obvious to the, uh, the general public with respect to our history. Um, but uh, even though we saw the revolution coming uh, and we invented a lot of what we take for granted today as digital photography, we were still not able to survive the day. And so I think there's some lessons uh, to be learned here. Um, first, let me start off with, with the, co the company itself, just to give you a brief primer. George Eastman was the founder of our company. He was trying to solve a problem. He, he found that photography by an average person was incredibly difficult because it involved carrying a gigantic camera with big plates that have to be coated right before you took pictures and a whole bunch of chemicals and a, basically a big uh, wagon full of chemicals in order to develop it. Okay? And so he worked on this idea. So he saw the problem. And he had two really interesting and novel ideas, and that's but on which the company was based. First was the development of flexible film. So film now could be rolled up into a coil, could be made much smaller, okay? And, uh, and then you could build a camera suitable for carrying around. Okay, and that was the Kodak, well this is 1888, this was uh, invented and launched, okay? And his second great idea um, was the, uh, uh, the, well, it wasn't the brownie, the second idea was the separation of uh, the uh, picture taking from the picture developing. Okay, that was a difficult part. So what he did was he allowed you to capture pictures. You bought a camera that held 100 exposures. You bought that, you set the camera in, and then, as he said, you press the button, we do the rest. So he separated those two. That was his business model, okay? So technology, business model. And it was very, very successful for over 100 years. He kept driving down the cost of uh, taking pictures. This was the, br the Brownie camera, which was introduced about 1900. It cost a dollar. Made two and, a, two and a quarter inch by two and a quarter inch circular exposures. It was meant for children. He wanted to get cameras into the hands of everybody. He basically democratized photography. He allowed anybody to take pictures now. That was his model. It was in 1935 that he launched Kodachrome film. That was the first practical color film. So now, instead of taking pictures in black and white, you can now capture them in color. Now, that was an incredible invention. It took just about 30 years of constant work to develop color film. Okay, so major technical changes take some time. He, almost, he often said that color was almost impossible. Why do we even try, all right? Um, but he managed to develop that. He developed other formulations of film. Coda color became very popular. Then the business model of supplying prints continued to grow. The more people took pictures, the more prints they wanted, the more money he made relative to that. Okay. And so the print business was, was enormous. And then we were in such a dominant position in the world in terms of photography, we could define the type and format of film and cameras. When Kodak decided you wanted a different kind of camera, then you got it. It was in the 1960s they developed the Instamatic. Okay, which was 126 uh, format film. You just take that cartridge and put it in. Again, he kept making it easier to take pictures. Okay, in the 1970s, he changed it to 110 film format, smaller negatives, smaller cameras. Okay, same film, same image quality. So film was getting better, image sizes were getting smaller, and convenience was getting bigger. Okay, 
And I continued in the 80s. This was, I knew the guy who actually invented this. It was Don Harvey was his name. And he developed the circular disc camera. You might even remember this one. And this was a really cool idea, okay? Again, the negatives were getting even smaller. I think these were like eight millimeter square or something. And yet the image quality was reasonable. And so these were truly pocketable cameras. Okay. And we continue that even in the 90s, they launched an APS system. That was, a, you might, might not remember that because it, it was an enormous uh, launch, okay? But at the wrong time, in my opinion. So this was the company that I hired into in 1973. They were the dominant force in the photographic industry and they had been so for a hundred years. I hired into a research laboratory uh, on the outskirts of Rochester, New York, which is the headquarters of Eastman Kodak Company. Um, and I hired into a research laboratory that was in, working with the, was called the Apparatus Division. Okay. And uh, two really great things happened to me there. First is I met my wife Cindy there. <laughs> and the second thing is I invented the digital camera. All right. And it was here that I was first proposed a, a project as a young engineer, electrical engineer, um, to look at a new type of device called the charge coupled device imager. It had been invented at Bell Labs about five, five years before that by two fellows named Boyle and Smith. Um, it was an innovative way of taking a, uh, a charge packet and moving it around on a piece of silicon and accurately maintaining the charge packet. And when you combine that with a surface where you could t shine light on a surface and make an exposure, that exposure of light would generate a corresponding charge pattern and then that charge pattern would then be read out using the CCD technology. This was the, the device that I was asked to look at. It was the only one that was made. It was made by Fairchild. It was available in 1974. I was given a super, I was, had about, about a 15 to 20 second discussion with my supervisor who said, why don't you get one of these and play with it, see if we can do anything useful with it. <laughs> that's literally the conversation that we had. Okay. Um, what resulted was uh, the development of a, um, a digital camera, a portable digital camera, and a playback system. And um, what I have here, uh, as part of the research laboratory, when I finished this project, um, I, had to write a I, write, I had to write a technical report. That was required of all projects. This project was a very subdued project. It was just me and one technician. We worked in a back laboratory. We had no budget. We had no reporting structure. Um, it, literally, I talked to my supervisor once every couple of weeks let them know what was going on, and that was it. It took us about a year, okay, and it resulted in this portable device which I could take pictures with, and I could display them on a television set. Um, and uh, this was a, 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 a one portion of the technical report that I wrote in late 1976. Because I was challenged so much as to, you know, what was going on with this thing, this was my vision of where I thought this technology might go. Now, I'd like to make the comment here that uh, uh, if half the people in this room read this, we'll double the number that have done so in the last 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> because the technical report was really circulated throughout management and promptly ignored. Okay. Um, however, um, although there were a number of demonstrations held of this system, active demonstrations where I came in with the managers and took their picture and showed them to them right in the room, uh, throughout 1976, there was no public acknowledgement of any of this work until 2001. Okay, and that happened when I was very fortunate to receive an award along with Ken Perolsky and, and Jim McGarvey uh, for the development of digital photography within the company. That is a, uh, a a new technology that was commercialized that ended up impacting the revenue of the company. This is the first picture ever taken of the camera and of me. I kept the camera. Uh, just because uh, it was a cool project. Uh, when you do R&D at Kodak, any R&D uh, produce was supposed to be destroyed because it was a tax thing, um, but I kept it. Um, and so when they asked me if I had it, I said I did have it. And uh, they said they wanted to take a picture of me for an article. And I checked with PR and I said, you know, you haven't been too happy about this for the last 25 years, you're talking about this, so is it okay? But now they were happy because now digital photography was happening. And it was really good to have been the inventor of the digital camera in terms of Eastman Kodak. Um, this is what the camera looks like. Um, it weighs about eight and a half pounds or so. It's about the size of a small toaster. Um, it, um, it was built out of spare parts. Uh, the budget for this was non-existent. Um, I could buy the CCD 
which was a horrible thing, by the way. It was very difficult to work with, very experimental. Um, but the rest of it, because I was working in Kodak, this is actually easier than it sounds. I could scrounge all the equipment to make this up. Okay, this uh, this uh, XL um, this lens right here is from an XL 55 movie camera. It turns out that the assembly line for that movie camera was just downstairs from my lab, so I wandered down there and out of the used parts bin stole one of the cameras. <laughs> and the image plane was just about the right size, and so I worked it in there. This tape system came from a, a well logging a, a well logging data recorder. That I stole from somebody. Um, so uh, most of the parts came from here. So this really came together, and this was a prototyping system. The reason it looks this way is because everything was built right in this system. We didn't build something somewhere else, make a circuit board, and then put it in here. We had no money or time for that. We had no idea what we're doing. Everything was white space. So we built it all in here. So it all unfolded. That's the playback system over there. That one we talked them into buying a microprocessor development system. We used an excuse by saying we should do research into microprocessors because they were just coming out at the time. And so they bought that, and then we used that as our playback system. And um, the tape, and so, so the way this thing worked is I took an exposure with this camera. Um, it took 50 milliseconds to capture a picture. It was read into a fast, fast image buffer, a digital image buffer. And then it was slowly read out from that digital buffer into a more permanent form of storage uh, that's uh, the, the tape there, right there. And then the reverse happened when we went to the playback system, but I had to do image processing at the time. Uh, I had to take the 100 lines. That was the size of the array, by the way. It was 100 pixels by 100 lines, okay, so 10,000 pixels. And I had to interpolate that to fit the NTSC standard. We had about 490 displayed lines, so I did it to 400 lines. And that was all done in assembly language by hand. Uh, it was horrible, but anyway, so this is the system that was demonstrated in 1976, okay? Uh, for your notes, this camera still does exist. Eastman Kodak still owns it. It is presently on display in the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. The playback system is long gone because it was absorbed to doing other things. Now the timetable for this, um, first image was taken in, in December of 1975. I must tell you that um, for the year we worked on it, we could see nothing. All you saw were voltage measurements on a DVM or oscilloscope trace measurements. That was it. There was no images because everything to see an image we had to build. Okay, so this went on for about a year. We finally thought we got it working. And so we walked down the hallway and there was a young lady. Her name is Joy Marshall and she was sitting <coughs> at a teletype. And I asked her if I could take a head and shoulder shot of her. Uh, this is just a regular picture of her, not the one that was taken <laughs> with my camera. But I show this because she had very black hair. Okay, and that was the key. Um, so we took a head and shoulder shot of her, clicked the button, the exposure was taken, the tape started to run, that's how I knew it was working. And then I walked back into the, to, to the lab just down the hallway, popped the tape out, put it in the system, about 28 seconds later, up popped the image and You could see her hair, you could see the white background, but her face was complete static, completely unrecognizable. Now Jim and I were standing right looking at this monitor, I remember this like it was yesterday, and we were so happy. We knew a thousand reasons why you wouldn't see anything on the screen, okay? But the fact that we could see a geometric shape that looked like what we just saw was fantastic. Okay. Now Joy had followed us into the, to the lab. She was standing by the door. And we turned around and we saw her and she looked at us and she said, needs work. <laughs> I had reversed the order of the pitch when I was designing the playback system. So the darks that were all zeros were okay and the whites that were all ones were okay. That's why we could see the outline, but the, the contones of the, the, in between levels were, were, were no longer visible. We fixed it in about an hour later. That was the first picture. That was taken in, in early December of 1975. Uh, we issued the technical report that I referenced there. It was about a 60-page report, largely describing how this thing worked, because I foolishly thought that people would be interested in how this thing worked. We had pulled an enormous number of tricks to pull together a whole bunch of technologies that were never meant to work together to actually do this function that had never been done before. Um, so that's why we wrote the report. But that little blurb I showed you in the front was just uh, an opinion piece that I felt obligated to put in there because of all the discussion we subsequently had. Uh, and then we applied for and received a patent, the first patent for a digital camera called the 919 patent. That was uh, issued in 1978. That was the first and only public disclosure of this work because patents are made public. Um, I was called on several occasions by people 
that found my name and called Kodak and got me, and they asked me about this patent, and I was promptly told by public relations, do not answer any questions about it, send them to us, which is what I did. Now, um, the reaction of management. Um, <laughs> Here's, I think I explained to you how, how this worked. I, I would walk in with that camera, and I had a presentation ready with slides and everything, but I never got to it, because what I did was I walked in and I would take a picture of the person who was sitting on the front. It was a long table, a long room like this, and I would take the picture of the person sitting nearest me on the right. I would take a head and shoulder shot of him. And then I would start to describe what I had just done and what this thing was. That was to cleverly hide the 23 seconds it was going to take me to take the second picture, by the way. And then I would took this, a second picture of the person sitting on the left. Then I would pop the tape out, hand it to Jim. Jim would put it in a playback system, which we had put on a little cart, put it in the back of the room, and up would pop up the image. Okay. We showed this to a whole sequence of managers, starting with, you know, you know how this works. You, you show it to your boss and get him comfortable, and then he shows it to his boss and he gets comfortable. And we had lots of boss layers at Kodak. <laughs> so we, we had lots of meetings. And this took place all throughout the spring and summer of 1976. Many, many demonstrations. Their reaction, um, first of all, we kept going up and then it sort of stopped. And um, OK, that was fine. I think I showed it to enough people. Um, but the highest level of the corporation did not see it. I mean, like the CEO. I had never met the CEO. I had never seen the CEO. Um, but I was told that they had heard about it, and they asked, should they come and see it? And the answer was no. Wasn't ready for prime time. Now, at the time, I was a little annoyed because I never met a CEO before. But uh, it turns out, when you think about it, here I was in 1976 taking available light photographs, not using film, and showing them without using photographic paper. How would you like to explain that to the CEO of Eastman Kodak Company? Nobody had any really good answers, including me. Okay, um, but so that's why they hesitated, and so it only got up as high as the uh, as the as the head of the apparatus division, which was fairly high up. Um, generally, the reaction was is too far out there for seriously consider considering this. Because not only was I not using film and not using paper. It didn't require any of the great business model that Eastman Kodak had formulated, built itself on the photo finishing network, right? We didn't need photo finishers anymore. So it was really a disruptive kind of a demonstration. Okay. So it was, they, they really didn't seriously worry about this thing too much. They were quite <laughs> sure that people would not want to look at their pictures electronically at all. Why? Because for the last hundred years, prints had been great. Nobody was complaining about the photographic system that we had. It was perfectly fine. Okay? There were no complaints. Okay? So they didn't think that was really a viable approach to it. And there were lots of other questions. How are you going to elect? What's an electronic photo album look like? That was one that they really, really bothered them. When were you going to get film-like quality? When would this be available for a consumer? I didn't have answers to any of these questions. In fact. As a young technologist, I thought all they'd ask me is, how did I get this to work? And they didn't ask me how, they asked me why. Why did you do this? Why would anybody want this? And when would they ever see it in reality? I didn't have that answer, but I kept being asked the question. So when you ask the question a hundred times, you get desperate. And so I used Moore's Law, which people generally believed back then, and they still do today. Um, and I said, called up the research laboratory, where they knew everything there was to know about image quality. And I asked them point blank, I said, how many pixels would I need to have a good consumer camera picture? Now, I quickly added 110 film format, that middle one of the 1980s, because it was a really small negative. You know, I was looking for like the easiest answer. I didn't pick 35 millimeter. So for 110 negative, answer, simple. One million pixels if you want a good picture, two million if you want a good color picture. I had 10,000 pixels, 10,000 to two million. Using Moore's Law, I made some rough estimates, not knowing if CCD technology at all applied with Moore's Law. Um, and I came up between 15 and 20 years. So that's what I told them. 15 or 20 years, which is beyond the working life lives of most of the executives in that room. Okay, which was, 
I learned a lot about public relations by the way doing this. You know what I entitled this talk? I called it filmless photography. Bad choice. You know, given the audience, you know. So you learn stuff by doing this, this kind of thing. Okay. Um, now, I want to take you back to 1976. It's easy to, to sit today and say, gee whiz, why didn't you see this? But think about this. Um, first of all, digital was not part of the everyday experience. This was a completely digital product. Digital was not common. Every, everything today is digital, right? Digital transformation, everything, right? Back then, nothing was digital. Okay. So I didn't really talk about it being a digital. In fact, I called it an electronic still camera. To call it a digital camera made it seem more complicated, more distant, more futuristic, more unreliable, more complicated. Right? That's the reputation that digital had back then. Okay. So what you do is you started. I started using an analogy. The only digital product I could think of was calculator, the HP 35 calculator. Does anybody remember that? <laughs> really? <laughs> right. You know how many audiences I give this to, and nobody. It's very depressing. I said, think of this as a calculator with a lens. That was the vision. So I tried to use an analogy to get this across, okay? It's kind of, the calculator was kind of small, right? I was really using imagination here, and I said, and an imaging to that. So that was the analogy I used. Developments, now we didn't actively consider because I wasn't trying to project this, but they were asking me about it. And the first was personal computers. Now, personal computers really weren't out yet. Um, but they were just starting to come out. Um, I found uh, uh, Jobs and Wozniak put their first Apple computer board, and they were trying to make it easier for someone to get a personal computer by doing this. I got interested in it because Wozniak used the same DRAMs I did. Again, I'm a tech geek, right? So I said, same DRAMs, but I had to use mine entirely differently than his. I wanted to see how he used his, you know, just to learn, right? But I came across this board, so I said, well, the playback system might be built on something like this, right? Again, another analogy that was just coming on board. People didn't know how to interpret personal computers at the time, but this was happening out there. Now, you can get in trouble by doing this because one of the managers from the uh, photographic, professional photographic division, um, I remember this like yesterday, standing up, and he said, okay, Sasson, how much is that calculator? Well, I said, it's about $400 or so, and that's what it was. How much for this uh, this board from the California guys? About six, seven hundred dollars. Okay, so for eleven hundred dollars, you can give me a way worse picture than an Instamatic loaded with film for thirty-five dollars. Why are we talking about this? So you got to be careful with analogies. Um, and I didn't have an answer. Okay, but that was the mindset. Okay, comparing it to the present state. The internet. I was always thinking point to point. I did talk about sending this electronically over a telephone line. Once you had it electronically, that was sort of a natural. But I wasn't thinking about the internet. Without the internet today, digital photography would be a lot less useful, if you ask me. Um, the internet was about this state at the time. It was called ARPANET in the US. Um, so I missed that totally. Um, local area networks, the able to send information around. I never really thought about that. I always thought of pulling things out. I thought of memory cards. I, I wanted to build a memory card for this, but I couldn't afford the digital memory to do it. And, and I didn't want it to be less reliable than film. You're always compared to the present state. So if I ever lost an image, even if it was a crummy one, but if I lost it using the digital storage technique, that would sort of put a chink in the armor of this whole thing. They say, well, it's never going to be reliable. So I went with tape, which was actually pretty reliable. And then photographic printing in the home. The idea of being able to photograph print electronically in your home was never the discussion in the 70s. We just didn't think about that. It was always take it to a photo finisher and get a print. So you can see that, that, that I didn't have a particularly clear view of the rest of the way the world was going to go. I just believed that this approach to photography had some viability. I just wasn't sure how, how good it would get and how long it would take. Now, I show you this for two reasons. One, I actually kept this document, and I kept it just because it was my first request for patent, but it also is the first official document ever talking about a digital camera. It was a note after I had showed it to the patent department, they came up with one of my demonstrations. They thought it might be worth considering filing an invention report on. And so that was their request. They didn't want me to do a whole story. They just said, send me a paragraph or two, and we'll write something up. 
That was Dennis Monteith. By the way, he was the guy who actually uh, did, did the uh, patent. And w it, when it was granted later, uh, this was the, the official notice that I got. Uh, and, and basically it describes the patent, and the patent basically is an architectural patent, a fundamental architectural patent of, of digital cameras. It basically describes taking image data, digitizing it, reading it into a fast memory, and then reading it out of it, out of it at a slower rate to a slower memory, that memory being permanent. That's fundamentally claim one of it. But it fundamentally represents the architecture of every digital camera ever made, basically, a still camera. Now, I want to I, I show you this on the, the first page of the patent is there. Um, I show you this here. Uh, they didn't think it was ever going to be used commercially. It wasn't used then, and they didn't think it was going to be used commercially <coughs> then. And they only filed it, like I said, in, in one country. Okay. Um, but they did do it. So I share that with you. Uh, now, what happened next, this is when we started moving in time. Okay, We started moving. In, still in 1976, the other fundamental invention that came out of Kodak was by Bryce Beyer was called the Bayer Array, and that's the patent number if you ever read that patent. It's really a study about image science and how people perceive images. And his idea was he found a way to do a, uh, a color filter array that you would put on top of a monochromatic sensor like a CCD, um, and you could fool the eye into seeing full color. Okay, It's called the Bayer Array, and if you have a digital camera with you with a camera in it right now, you have a Bayer Array on it. It was a fundamental invention. You see, this was what's great about Kodak. These guys knew so much about image science that they could come up with these ideas long before they were needed. He didn't talk about digital cameras in his patent. He talked about how I can get the eye to do this. How, how can I fool the eye-brain combination to do this? But it was brilliant. Um, what happens also as you start to develop technology is you get alternative solutions by new competitors. Sony announced in Mavica in 1981 and Sony basically said, we're going to take over the photographic industry with this. Now, they were an electronics company, largely an analog and video company. And they proposed uh, a, a camera that would use a CCD, but you would record on a little disc like that, two-inch two inch disc. Now, you think it's a disc, so it's digital. It's not. It was analog. Okay. They took basically their VCR technology and adapted it to a circular disc that would rotate at the frame rate of a TV set and record either one field or two fields to constitute a frame. See, when you're a technology company that specializes in hammers, you make everything look like a nail. Okay, so they thought that they could solve the problem. Now, I love this for two reasons. One is you could talk all you wanted about digital photography inside of Kodak, and you got lukewarm response, basically a pat on the head. But when a major competitor, new competitor, announces they're going to take over your business, with this electronic, whether it's viable or not, that gets management moving. So we got a lot more investment in this, a lot more interest in this. Okay. And consequently, the other reason I liked it because I knew it wouldn't work. Because it fundamentally had a recording system that um, sub-optimized the image quality inherently. And you can't replace a technology with a new one. Uh, by missing the fundamental attribute of the one you're replacing. In other words, image quality for film was good. You can't replace it with something worse. Okay. So that was why, we, why I liked it. Um, we were forced to go public with our work on CCDs, which had continued since the early 80s. We knew that CCDs, the images themselves, had to be bigger than the established companies that were making them. Fairchild, uh, RCA. They wanted to replace Viticon tubes, which had the resolution of TV systems. <coughs> But we knew whatever photography was going to evolve to, it was going to have to have millions of pixels. So we started developing these millions of pixels. But we never told anybody about it. But Sony was making such a splash with Mavica that the, the public started to lose confidence that Kodak could see where things were going. And it was in a show in 1986 when our management saw it on day one. Sony had rolled out this thing, beautiful pictures. And they told the research guys to bring their megapixel sensor, which was way bigger than to show it, and by the end of the week, Sony had closed their presentation. We were ahead of them, but we didn't want to tell anybody. Okay? And we didn't want to answer any questions about it. The questions we got were, wow, that's really good. When's that going to come out? It's not ready yet. <clears throat> Trust us, it's not ready yet. Okay, and the last one, and here's what I want to show you how products go, or major technological uh, jumps happen in steps. Image compression was the big problem because as we got more and more millions of pixels, 
We knew it was going to take several million pixels to be equivalent to film. Okay. In order to do that, everything got worse. Memory storage, image processing speeds, everything got terrible. Okay, so things were getting worse for digital photography, not better as we got closer to photographic quality. So we knew that image compression was going to be an issue. Again, Kodak had the people that knew all about this. I went to Majid Rabani, who was one of the leading experts in image compression in the world. He worked at Kodak. And I asked him, I said, I need to get image compression out of the laboratory and I want to put it in a product. Which one should I use? There were about 24 different algorithms being discussed around the world. It was like arguing religion. Honestly, it was terrible to be in these conversations. Everybody thought they had the ultimate answer. But Majid, quiet guy, very humble guy, said, DCT compression, discrete cosine transform. That's the one to do. And I looked at this algorithm, and it was really complicated. So I said, have you got anything else? And he said, no, that's your problem. He says, the world will decide in discrete cosine transform. They just don't know it yet. <laughs> so, okay, so we tried to build this product using this new technology, but we didn't know how to do it. Okay, so I want to show you a product you've never heard of, okay, but it's fundamental in the development of digital photography. It was a transceiver. We had launched a series of products around still video floppy. We had launched a player, we had launched a printer, we had launched a viewer, and they were all wonderful, but it was all around still video floppy, and in my opinion, I kept my distance from it because I knew it was never going to go anywhere. But we proposed to the management at the time, let's build a device that can capture a still image, maybe off of a still video floppy, it doesn't have to, it can come off the camera, and let's basically make an image transmission system, a little box like this, okay? And what this thing would do is we would capture an image, we would store it, we would do this magic compression that you talk, we talked about, and then I would take a modem and send it over a telephone line. And the requirements are, you could not tell the difference between the image first stored, because you'd look at it on a monitor here, and after it was decompressed and reconstructed in the image on the other end of the telephone line. You could not tell the difference. Now, when you're in Kodak and you say you can't tell the difference, that's saying something. Because we have people with, like, special eyeballs that look at this stuff, okay? And there's all kinds of tricks you have to play to do this. And also, we wanted to do it in under a minute. That was our goal. Under a minute, visually lossless. Okay. No one had ever done that before. No one had ever put this kind of compression in a, port, in a, in a commercial device before. What we tried to do is we tried to put um, our image science in it. Because Kodak knew how people looked at images and what they would tolerate in terms of defects, you can't believe the number of uh, amount of image research that was done by Kodak. Every single picture ever taken at Disney World, we got hands on. We knew it. And we could see what people, what people liked and didn't like. We knew what people would tolerate. So what the, DC, what the, the DCT did was decorrelate the image in a way that allows you to now apply human visual response to it to eliminate 80% of the bits. So wh whatever you captured, you take 80% of those bits, you're going to throw them away. And with the rest of the 20, send it over the telephone line, reconstruct it, and you can't tell the difference. Now, it was very difficult to do this. We had to use Texas Instruments. I had to go down to Texas Instruments and to pretend I was an image compression expert, which I was not. Okay, but Majid taught me enough so I was like a parrot. I went down there just to find the guy who was built the chip that we were trying to use to make this run faster. Okay, so we were doing, we were really pulling all stops out to try to get this to work. Well, we finally did get it to work. And it was a, it was a really incredible accomplishment because it was really cool it really did work well okay and we didn't think we could do it and then something unexpected happened see we were launching it for sale but i i didn't know if anybody would buy this thing i didn't really care okay and i don't think our marketing arm really cared they didn't know who to sell it to maybe some law enforcement in real estate to send pictures over telephone lines who knows i didn't care cbs news bought one cbs news bought them in 1989 the Tiananmen square happened and the Chinese government shut off all outside communication of conventional photography. They had this device. The Chinese didn't know about it. Nobody knew about it. They were the only people to get pictures out. So they were scooping every news organization in the world. They got all excited. They came to Kodak and said, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. We want to tell the world about it. We want to do a story about it. 
So you have a major news organization wanting to do a free story about your product. You think they'd be excited about that? Well, you know they weren't. <laughs> they didn't want it because they said it's going to disturb our established customers. The established customers, the people who were trying to get pictures out with film and paper, couldn't get it out. Kodak sold this weird device to, to one of their competitors, and they're getting the advantage. Kodak, you tricked us. You didn't tell us about this. They didn't want anybody to know. We had a very clever uh, fellow named Dr. Bradley Paxton, who, in addition to being a very innovative manager, could, 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 could smooth talk upper managers into all kinds of stuff. And he said, okay, here's what we're going to do. Because this is so cool, we really got to do something, guys. We won't mention Kodak. We won't tell the name of the product at all. Okay? Just, maybe just a little story about the technology. Well, okay, as long as Kodak doesn't, you know, we don't, we don't, we don't want to offend anybody. So I'm going to show you the video they created right now. Okay? And you'll see that they don't use the name of the product. Um, you'll see the way the image comes up. It's very unconventional. Those are the DCT blocks coming up very fast. We had done this uh, faster than anybody. Um, and that this DCT compression basically was the right one because if you have files, you call them .jpg, JPEG, that is DCT compression. That's what we did. We were the first people to do it. Okay. So I want to show you this now. Uh, just because it's really on the streets of Beijing. Now, the sights we have seen so far have been gripping, and it has taken a marvel of technology to get them out of the country. We had that story from Channel 2's Jane Velez Mitchell. They've roughed up reporters, but the Chinese government still hasn't been able to stop it. The flow of compelling images, massacres, monumental courage, pictures that have galvanized world opinion. The horror stories have kept seeping out, even after Chinese officials confronted CBS News anchorman Dan Rather and made him shut down the satellite that was used to feed videotape of the historic democracy movement. After the Chinese officials shut down the satellite, they may have thought that they had stopped the flow of videotape from China to the rest of the world. Normally that would have been true. Normally you would have had to have physically transported the videotape to another feed point in Tokyo or Hong Kong and sent it from there. But in this case, thanks to new technology that CBS used for the very first time during this crisis, the network was still able to get dramatic pictures directly out from China to New York and then to the rest of the world. It's called a transceiver or pixelator. Folks here at CBS Network call it a magic box, a machine that takes moving pictures, captures a single frame, then breaks that frame down into computer information or digits, and through an ordinary phone line, sends it to a similar magic box in New York. It then takes the information and turns it back into a single picture. Reporters in Beijing then use a cellular phone to speak live on television from Tiananmen Square over the pictures. Do you hear that gunfire? Okay, we've got to get out of here. Commandeering the crisis coverage for CBS, Lane Bernardos, director of special events for CBS News. He says that single piece of equipment, the magic box, has changed the face of its news coverage. This is a godsend. We could not have done what we've done over the last, you say, 36, 48, 72 hours without this kind of device. To the Chinese, it's been a lifeline to the world. We took in some still photographs of crowds cheering our TV crews. They're so happy to see us, even though it's forbidden now officially. Uh, the people are saying, they were saying to our crews, get our story out. While the Chinese could confiscate the magic box in Beijing, fans of the new technology feel no regime can stop the flow of technological advance and predict the future will make it increasingly difficult to violate human rights in an ever-shrinking global village. Jane Velez Mitchell, Channel 2 News. Okay, so uh, that's sort of the title you ne just never know, okay? Okay, this was a technological development, uh, but it, it went right to the fears of management. That is, it somehow escaped out there and caused a problem with our existing customers. Okay, some customers really liked it. CBS News really liked it. Okay, but a lot of the other photographers did not. Okay, but why did I do this? Why, why did we do this? I'm going to say there's a team of people we were working on this now. It wasn't that big a team, by the way. The team that developed this thing was probably on the order of 12 people. Um, uh, the project I'm about to describe to you, which was leveraged off of this, was probably about the same size, maybe 15 people. 
Um, why do we do this? Well, let's take a look at the architecture of this thing. Frame store, DCT compression, modem. Okay? And we plugged in a camera. If you can do that, one step, then what would happen if you took a CCD imager from the research lab and put it in front of that? You replace that modem with a memory card. You take some batteries, you shrink this all down into something configurable. You put a big lens assembly in front of it. What do you have? That's why we did it. But you had to do it in steps. Okay? So, we knew we were going to build this. So I went to, now this time, I did a smart thing. I went to a real camera designer. His name was Bob Hills. He is a Scotsman. He's been designing cameras since he was knee-high with a milk bottle. He'd forgotten more about cameras than I'll ever know. He had designed every single kind of film camera there was. And I went to him and said, we want to build a digital camera. And he knew about digital. He saw it coming. Okay? He didn't like it. All right? But he said, okay, we'll do that, Sasson, but we're not going to build one of the stupid cameras you build. It's going to look like a camera. It's going to act like a real camera. Okay? We're not building these crazy things you like to build. Okay, fine. So for the next year or so, he designed and worked on a camera that you've never seen because it was never produced. But they were hand designed. They were used ch chin on parts. Okay, and it had specifications like I list here. Okay, um, it used memory cards. It used JPEG compression. You could buffer that. You could take several images quickly and then the compression would catch up to it later on. So it was buffering just like a real 35 millimeter camera could do. Okay. Um, it was quite portable. It had lenses, interchangeable lenses. Okay, Bob did a good job on this. These cameras were operational in 1989. We went to marketing. It was professional marketing. And we asked them, could you um, sell any of these cameras? We had about half a dozen of them built. They were all by hand. And I, I don't want to tell you this is a production design. But if a dozen people on the top floor of building one could build this, I always thought, what could Sony do? Sony didn't know how to do this or what to do, but they certainly had the capability once they learned to do it. Okay. Uh, and so we asked them, and you know, the answer was pretty clear. They weren't subtle about it at all. Of course we can, but we won't. If it comes at the expense of one film camera, why would we? Think about it. Sell a film camera, I got a film stream. I got people visiting photo finishers. I don't have to answer any weird questions. I don't have to have instruction manuals. I don't have to have all the computers. This thing is a pain. It's a whole new thing. So the program was largely dropped. Now, a lot of these things, we, it did continue in another form, in another organization. Uh, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. Um, Bob and I got discouraged uh, at this because this was the time between 1975 and I would say 1989 with the development of this camera, I feel you could have had robust technical dis disagreements as to the viability of digital photography. Okay. You could talk whether images would ever get good enough, whether image processing could get fast enough, could memory could get cheap enough, okay? You could argue those points. But in 1989, I believe this was a proof point. If we could build this, other people could too. And so it was no longer a technical discussion now it became a marketing, maybe even a cultural discussion. Uh, we filed a patent for this, by the way, um, and, and uh, we almost didn't do it. Uh, it was called the 107 patent. It turned out to be that plus four other patents that were filed later in the 90s are earned more money for Eastman Kodak Company than they ever made off of the sale of any and all digital cameras in their entire portfolio. The intellectual property was quite lucrative. The cameras themselves were not. Let me tell you what happened with the, the commercialization of cameras. A lot of the guys who built that camera moved over to another group by Jim McGarvey, and we started doing professional cameras. We started looking at markets where we could, where someone would be interested in this. First, it was the government. This is the Hawkeye accessory. There was only a handful of these built, okay? And it was the it was the first version. We take a Nikon camera and we string it to a box of electronics to do what we were doing in that small camera before. Okay. And the reason the box was there wasn't because they couldn't make it smaller, was because each customer was looking for something different. When you go into a marketplace, a new one, it's a lot of customization because you're experimenting with those customers to find out what they really want. Okay. Um, this one actually ended up in government hands, went across uh, the space shuttle in 1991. A lot of people don't know that. 
That was the first digital camera in space. Uh, the first really commercial viable one was in 1991. It was called the Professional DCS. This camera also was a Nikon body, tethered to a great big box like this, okay, with a screen. So you could see the image you took, okay. Uh, you could put image compression in it if you wanted to. That's another issue. Image compression revolved getting rid of data, but you couldn't see it or you could barely see it. And that was a cultural anathema to Eastman Kodak Company. Image quality was everything. So they always wanted to provide an option to switch off compression if you wanted to do real photography. Okay, so we had cultural problems in addition to technical ones here. Um, these cost $25,000 a piece. There were 925 of them sold, largely to photojournalists. They bought this because they could take a picture and they could send it back. They could view it right away and send it back so it could be on the cover of the magazine or newspaper within hours. That was money to them. That was worth taking a worse picture with an awkward piece of equipment. So we found the market niche and we found what they wanted. So quickly we moved to a single model. It's in 1992. Um, this was uh, the, uh, the DCS, we ended up calling the DCS 200. Um, and um, it was all self-contained. It used a very, technologies moved very fast. So this was using a, a 200 megabyte drive. This was a, a small disk drive that we put in here. They shrunk it all down. This was done in about a year, year and a half. The technology was moving, but we also knew what the customer wanted. And we were evolving toward an ultimate design. So this was, and then this found its way, photo, more photojournalists, of course, were buying this. Over 3,000 of these were sold. And um, they were, uh, it was very successful, and it was followed by a, a bunch of other uh, cameras. Let me talk about the consumer space, because this was professional. The consumer space, that was really, we were, we were afraid of the consumer space in talking about this. Apple Computer came to us and said they would want it to be the imaging computer. Okay, you, even, even today, graphic artists tend to use uh, Apple Computers. They, they wanted that space, so they wanted an accessory to get images into their computer. They wanted a digital camera. They came to us. We designed and built it. Okay. And by the way, uh, you'll notice the shape of that camera. The guy, the head designer for that, Tom Kelly, told me, I was giving a uh, talk like this back in Rochester a few years ago. He came up and he says, you know why it looks like that? Because they told me it had to look like that. It couldn't look like a real camera. It had to look like binoculars or anything about a real camera. It was intentionally designed that way to look different. Okay. Our name didn't appear on it. We didn't appear on any of that stuff. Okay. Apple Computer started selling it. It was the first sub $1,000 consumer camera, color camera, it stored about eight images. Um, it was actually very successful. And then Kodak finally entered the market under their own name, was the DC-40. You see it looks surprisingly similar to this one. They finally adopted, say, okay, we'll take that design and put it out there. And we started, we opened up a new, we had a new uh, marketing arm called DNAI to try to sell these cameras. It wasn't the consumer arm, the traditional arm. We created a new arm to do this, okay? And that created a whole bunch of organizational difficulties, as you can imagine, when you're fighting over the same channels, right? Now I want to share with you um, uh, something that's important, what's called the dominant design. When you have a new technology coming together, pretty soon there will be a point in time where all of the features find the right places in the product and represents sort of the base case. The, the base case on which now cameras can be designed and compared, they can be manufactured, the price can be driven down, okay? And so this was what the dominant design was, 1998, first megapixel camera, had, had LCD display, removable card, had video output, had wireless control. You can see how it looked like that, it looked sort of like a camera. So this was basically what we called the dominant design. The, the designs now had coalesced into something we felt the consumer would be looking for in this new type of a camera. So, timeline for cameras. Here's a timeline. I took this, uh, Jim McGarvey ran the digital professional uh, group uh, from our, the early 90s up until 2005 when we went out of the business, okay? And I show up here, you can see my little friend up here um, you can see uh, some of the other cameras. Ecamm doesn't show up here because nobody wanted to admit we built it. Um, but we had other cameras here. On the professional space, you can see we're improving all the time, going all the way up to a 14 megapixel camera by the year 2005. Okay. 
And then these are some of the other competing cameras that were coming out at the same time. Now I want to show you something else. This is the price of cameras, consumer cameras largely, during the same time period. I tried to line these graphs up around the same time period. And you can see what was happening here. These things were starting to fall, consumer cameras, dramatically. Okay. And so the, 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 the business was being defined. The dominant design was here. People were just starting to get interested in it, and the prices were plummeting. Okay. So there wasn't money in digital cameras. <laughs> it was an exciting space to be in, but there wasn't much money in it. And we had a lot of competitors. Kodak wasn't used, Kodak was used to dominating things. The barrier to entry to making photographic film was enormous. So there's really only been a hand, less than a handful of companies that successfully managed to make photographic film for over a hundred years. Okay. All of a sudden, we're in a business now where competitors are coming out of the woodwork. They have all these capabilities that we don't have, and the price is falling. Now, let me share with you um, what was going on with film at the same time. Okay? Here was film, peaking in around 2001. So the time when these new markets were coming to place, the new cameras were coming out, customers were getting interested in them, the dominant design was coming about, film was still growing. Okay, so now you've got a displacement issue, right? Why bother? We're doing quite well, right? But meanwhile, the technology was starting to come. Here was digital cameras starting to grow here. Look at the film cameras peaking right around the same time, right? We saw it coming. We had the technology. The marketplace was coming, but it wasn't economically viable. Okay. Now, I want to show you uh, the other side of this. The output side, it's, it's not just film, although film is very profitable. Um, uh, photographic prints, same situation, about two years behind it, okay? I went off to do printers, and I did thermal printers, and we did the kiosks, and kiosks used a new type of uh, printing device that used heat to make these prints, and it wasn't photographic paper, but it was still a, a material that Kodak would sell, we like doing that. Um, and so that became the vehicle of choice for people making prints with their digital cameras. This is before iPads and things, so people were still making prints. So the print business was behind the film business. And you can see it was about, about a two or three year fall in digital, uh, digital uh, uh, film prints. And you can see the prints rose until about 2007 because cell phones started to come and you didn't need prints, okay? But that was sort of the marketplace. So you can see, both halves of the equation, you know, the technology was defined, it was still growing, then it fell like a rock. That, that, that previous curve was about 18% a year. Okay. And the, 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 the print business, we were, we were participating in this, so that was a good, that was a good piece of the business. Okay. Right. Um, margins weren't quite as high, but they were pretty good. Uh, but then it leveled out. So, um, let me talk a little bit about the culture of the company, because this is kind of important. Um, again, it's my impression, but <coughs> image quality was everything. You never compromised image quality. Okay, It always needed to be better. If you tried to launch a product that had inferior quality, it was really frowned upon. And that's why we had so much trouble with the early digital cameras, why image compression was such a problem, it was because image quality. We had to launch perfect products. We had a reputation to protect. And that is probably the biggest anchor around Codex and that. We could never miss because people trusted us implicitly. The photographic business is a business of trust. You're going on your once in a lifetime vacation and you snap your picture and you, you're trusting that it's all working. And if you don't trust it, <laughs> you're dead. So the reputation, we were afraid to make a mistake. We valued consumables above anything else. That was our business. We sold stuff. And any equipment that we would sell or make, like digital cameras, were really a way just to sell stuff. But what stuff do you sell with a digital camera? And then finally, a perfect process leaves, leaves perfect products. We were really good on process. When we commercialized devices, it was, it was, it was painful, some of, the, some of the stuff we had to go through for some of the processes we had to adhere to, for innovative products that may or may not have that process applied to. But that was forced upon a lot of people. Um, and I want to basically talk about some of the culture 
we had a management mindset at Kodak, okay? And I would say leadership tend to be secondary. And I would talk about management. Management keeps you where you are. You don't lose anything with good management, okay? You're listening to your customer, you're maintaining your relationships. Kodak was great at this, okay? We were really good at this. We had great customer relationships. We had a great public persona, okay? So we were good at management. Leadership is something else. Leadership takes you to a different place. Now I will tell you, as an innovator, we were celebrated, but we weren't empowered. So they'd give you an award, they give you a raise for doing something clever, right? But you really couldn't push it to get out to the real world. I worked at the company more than, more than uh, well, was it 12 or 13 years before I actually saw any of my electronic stuff actually show up in the customer's hands. That was that transceiver. And they thought that was a mistake getting that out there. Okay. So anytime an effort stumbled, they thought, eh, we're losing management control. And that usually doomed the project. Okay, and I talk about the, the basic tenets of leadership, challenging the process, inspiring a shared vision, enabling others to act. These things were characteristics that had to be practiced, but when anything went out of whack, management came in and took over. And that usually ended it. And there were a number of projects I could quote that had that happen. Um, some observations. We were long aware that this was coming. I hope I've convinced you of that with the story I've told you, okay? But we were never able to find a business model that was as profitable as film. Now, film was very profitable. George Eastman deserves a big statue somewhere. He created a money machine that lasted for 100 years and it was unequaled in consumer electronics. It really is. The Kodak slogan, you press the button, we do the rest. You don't need to do the rest. That's fundamentally what happened. The technology displaced the need for a function. Um, we were reluctant to deal with the threat because Kodak historically were able to drive most of the major changes in the industry. And people looked to us to do it. It wasn't as if we had to convince people. They would say, what does Kodak say about this? Well, and I showed you those cameras that we developed every 10 years, right? That, 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 that was very typical. Okay. So we didn't really react to a threat as intensely as we should because we thought we dominated the field. And people would wait for us to tell them when it was ready. Um, and the film business was profitable right to the end, okay? So it wasn't like it, it went off, really, uh, you know, tripled off. We were doing great gangbusters until it fell off the end. You saw the curve. Um, and then, quite frankly, confusion of what Kodak's business was. We were trying so many things toward the end. I want to show you a slide here. Um, uh, Who's in the picture business today? I'm going to just show you something here. This comes from Brad Paxton. I thought I mentioned you wrote a book about electronics at Kodak. And um, these, are all the these are all the businesses that Kodak was actively in. You know, we were in online before online was. We called the Kodak Gallery. Right? We used to send, send your pictures to our online. We were doing that before anybody else. Instagram, they, they weren't even there. But our business model was, send us a picture, we'll make you prints, we'll sell you stuff. That's what our business model was. So we, 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 we sort of molded these new technologies into the same old business model we always had. These are all the companies, all, all things we were doing. We had divisions for this, we had all kinds of, we, had, we were playing in all of these fields. Now these fields are successful fields, that's why I list the companies there. These guys are making money, okay? But we couldn't see it our way through because we didn't stick with it long enough. And in some cases, we went in and out of some of these businesses several times. I know for a fact, I think the inkjet, we went in, in and out of the inkjet business like four times in my career. So we have to know what our business is. You have to know what your business is and then you have to stick with it. Okay? And unfortunately, this is an example of uh, how diverse we were. Um, and let's talk about the extended effects of, of dis dis disruption. Now, this is something I touched on with um, the class yesterday. Not only did the business model disappear, okay, high margin materials, consumer touch points are reduced. Remember, think about this business model, guys. You go and you buy film, you go to the store. You go take your film back to develop, you go back to the same store. You go back there to pick up your prints, you go back to the same store. Three touch points for every event. <coughs> Pretty good, huh? No more. 
touch points are gone. Professional relationships curtailed. Part of our strength was people trusted us. So we'd sell them materials and we'd give them courses. We'd give them free equipment sometimes. It was a great relationship they had. They trusted us, right? And we trusted them as long as they kept buying film and paper from us, right? So our networks, well, those relationships were curtailed because we could no longer support that customer support. Those educational programs disappeared. <coughs> the free materials disappeared, the free equipment. Retail partners. It used to be that drugstores and, and, and supermarkets had a photo finishing space. When we went to, to uh, one hour photo finishing, that was the most profitable space they had in their store. <coughs> gone. <coughs> it's gone. So uh, the infrastructure, the, the infrastructure for making photographic film is enormous, as you can imagine. These, these, this equipment is gigantic. <coughs> it's buildings. These, these webs are 60 feet wide. They run at hundreds of feet per minute. They're coating over 200 chemicals. Uh, they're doing it extremely exactly, and they're doing it all in the dark. And so it's all custom. You can't maintain that stuff. You can't shut these things down. If you do, you can't start them up again. right? So that can't be maintained. The workforce skills. We have people that were specifically trained their whole lives to be film builders or manipulating film. This is a very custom work. They lost their job. <coughs> and in general, the employment contract that Eastman Kodak had with their employees was quite generous. We never had a union. It was, it was, it was, it was, uh, people loved the company and they had a good contract. We had good benefits. They had, Kodak was the first company to supply a wage dividend. It was the people that worked for George Eastman that went off and defined the social security system that's used in the United States. He was very attentive to employee satisfaction. Okay. That contract was gone. So technological displacement ripples through the entire network. And that's what happened with here, with us. What could you have done differently? Because I've been asked this all the time. Some suggestions. We made an investment from sterling drugs in 1988. We thought that if we bought sterling drugs, we could take our chemical prowess and apply it to the drug business, which was the only business we could recognize as having the profitability even close to film. When I say close to film, it was less than film. Okay, but we thought we thought okay, if we can if we could buy this company, so they, they spent 5.1 billion dollars for this. What that did was it put us in a cash poor position. We were a very rich company. Kodak had a lot of money, okay, um, and we were a dominant force in the industry. Okay. But now because of this investment, we were a debtor company, so we couldn't do some of the things we had to do in the early 90s because we didn't have the freedom to do that. That was probably a bad choice. I would have thought we would looked at an electronic company to do that. Move a portion of company to a different location and support it in a way that allows it to be truly independent. Kodak tried that in a number of cases, but they never let them really be independent. We had this, remember that management mindset? You, you can't lose control. And so that happened a lot. And they, we, didn't really, we didn't really do that. Um, here's something. <coughs> We had continuing film sales and continuing profits. But take those profits and actively in the mid-90s start investing in major other electronic companies or developing your own technologies. That is, capability to make chips and things like that. You know, instead, we invested in the APS system in 1996. We launched a new film system in 1996. The dominant design for digital cameras was less than a year away or two years away. I remember when they made that decision. I banged my head against the wall. I don't get it. And a lot of people that were working on digital did not get it either. But you know why we did it? Because that's what we knew how to do. Nobody else knew how to do this. And by the way, it wasn't just us. It was Fuji and Anko. We all got together and figured we're going to have to maintain or, 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 or sustain the film business for another couple of years. They invested up billions of dollars in this. New photographic equipment, new photographic film, new photographic cameras, photographic photo finishing equipment all around the world, new standard agreed to, but that's what we knew how to do, so we did it. It didn't last too long. The digital wave was coming. I thought that was a poor investment. Again, it's just my opinion. Um, and I think largely upper management had a problem. We had George Fisher came, was the first CEO we had that came from outside the company. Previous to that, all the CEOs came from inside the company, so you can imagine what their bias was. But he was from an electronics company, from Motorola. And um, 
I think he, he did he did a lot of waking up in the company, but he needed a staff of people that understood it. I think it needed to be thicker. I, it just can't be one person driving this. He needs to have a whole bunch of people that really understand where we're going, and he didn't have it. His next level of management were lifelong Kodak people. I, I wonder what he would say about this if he were here. I, I think he might agree, but maybe not. Um, alternative outcome. Um, you could instead choose at the right point to compete on your capabilities rather than the marketplace you're in. That's always a choice you can make when you're facing a discontinuity like this. Okay? So we could have went into working with chemicals, take all the people like me and send them packing and just concentrate on chemicals. Okay? Fuji did this. They actually make uh, LCD screens right now. They're into cosmetics. They're doing a lot of stuff. By my count, they have a $20 billion revenue. Okay. We sold the Eastman Chemical Division, which was our chemical arm, the, the guys who made all the chemicals. Okay, We sold it in 1994. We have to pay for that sterling stuff, guys. The revenue for Eastman Chemical as a separate company last year was $9.5 billion. The revenue for what Kodak is now is $1.5 billion. Okay. So there's a rational argument to be made for that. When George Eastman came, he said, we're not a film company, we're an imaging company. And so he was trying to get to that point, right? Um, but I think some of these things uh, uh, got in the way. All right, I've been talking long enough. My takeaway is here. It's very difficult to drive a disruptive innovation. I don't mean just a technological change or a, a change in design. I mean a fundamental technological, it's hard to drive it from within an organization. Organizations are not designed for it. You know, organizations, unfortunately, Successful ones have very well-developed no factories <coughs> for new ideas. And the people who drive the designs really don't have the skills to drive it. You know, we were talking before, when you're an innovator inside a, a company trying to get your idea accepted, you need skills that you probably never got in school or didn't get in anywhere. It has to do with some of the human skills, public relations, how to deal with people that are smarter than you and got more power than you and listen to them complain about your idea and then quietly take those, those things and merge it into something new. You know, you gotta, you gotta work at, 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 at getting people to believe in your idea when you don't have the data. These are all skills that are hard to acquire, especially for young people, which do most of the innovating, okay? Um, disruptive technologies are lower margin opportunities when they start out. We were always comparing whatever we were doing to what it was displacing, which was usually some form of film or paper, which was very profitable. I can't tell you the number of times I did a demonstration. I did a demonstration for a, a very high volume printer that was probably going to replace a photo finishing approach that we're doing with inkjet. And we did this for a very inexpensive uh, amount of money in a short period of time because we leveraged a bunch of technology. And we showed it to the managers. And these were the head of the company. They said, I get it. Show me the money. They were instantly comparing this to what we had. So when you start out, they're low margin until your customer starts coming to you, and of course that takes a while. And then um, just a, just something I observe, maybe you disagree. Despite all the evidence that you're looking at, successful companies continue to do what made them successful. It's not logical. It might not be supported by the data, but that's what human beings do when you're in a collective. And the only way that I've seen a change is when, when upper management makes uncomfortable decisions. When I say uncomfortable decisions, I mean decisions that make people hate them, <laughs> make the financial press make fun of them. Um, you know, it, it's, it's very difficult to make these rapid changes, these very big discontinuities. So that's why they usually don't happen inside of big companies in my opinion. So, that's my talk. <laughs> and I appreciate your attention. Um, and, uh